One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's December 22nd, 2022, closing in on Christmas, just around the corner. But before we get there, before we wrap up the year, we're going to take a look at the second five predictions of our prediction series. We're going to look at travel, where the S&P is going to end up, M&A, more mergers coming, and the best sports city in the world. All that more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 22nd of December, 2022. It's a Thursday and really people are getting ready to wrap up the week for the big Christmas holiday just a few days away. So first of all, I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday, whatever you're celebrating, if celebrating at all. Um, I hope you are safe, happy, spending with loved ones and, and truly just enjoying uh, your time the last uh, week or so left uh, in 2022. But again, before we wrap up 2022, I want to take a look at 2023 and five more predictions. And we're going to do that again today with uh, one of my analysts, but just a little programming note uh, that next week we are going to take the week off. I think we need a little vacation too uh, from doing the podcast. So take that week, spend it with your family uh, and your loved ones and your friends, and then we'll be back strong, uh, ready to kick off 2023. So speaking of 2023, with me again is Drew McConnell, one of my research analysts. He was with me on Tuesday as well. Going over the first five predictions, Drew. We got five more for everybody today. And these are kind of all over the place, but I, I gotta tell you, I think they're really important for our, uh, everybody to know. And the first one is that mergers and acquisitions, what they call m and I think the activity is gonna spike this year. And I think it's gonna really take off. A lot of that has to do with a lot of companies that are beaten up. So small mid cap companies have really got beaten down and the valuations have come down to levels that we've only really seen once or twice in the last 20 plus years. And when a company has a low valuation, because more attractive, right? Whether it's us or whether it's a company coming in to buy it. At the same time as those valuations have come down, large cap valuations have come down as well. But those large caps are sitting on tons and tons of cash that they can use to make really great acquisitions at low valuation prices. So what do you see kind of driving this uh, M&A activity coming in next year? Yeah, so I, I was actually going to mention the same thing. I was going to say that we've seen deal volume drop off significantly. So it peaked, I wrote down a couple of notes. It peaked in December 21. That mm -hmm. was the last high for M&A activity. And the average premium um, just before that was about 37% on deals. Mm -hmm. So typically you're getting almost 40% upside based on what the closing price was. Yep. Uh, the day before. Right now, last quarter, the average premium was 17%. Wow. So you can tell that the deals have gotten much closer to much closer to the value they might actually be worth. They're not paying as much anymore. But I would also look to companies that are sitting on a lot of cash because those are the ones that are going to be able to do these deals quickly and without having to raise funds at higher interest rates. And so you're going to have businesses that are, like you said, are established and sitting on big cash piles. They're going to want to put that cash to work. And I mean, one company that comes to mind immediately would be Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah. I mean, they're going to buy something, I would suspect, in the so next year. Or so I had a prediction last year, it might have been two years ago. I think it was last year, uh, and I made a prediction that that Warren Buffett, before he you know 
rides off in the sunset, he's going to make a major, major acquisition this year. And he didn't make anything major this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, he put, he made, put a lot of money in the Occidental Oxy, yeah, which is a, a big oil and gas, which worked out really well for him. But he didn't make a, like a, a, a big splash, if you will. And they're sitting on so much cash. And, you know, for his entire career, he's been known to go in when there's blood in the streets. I believe he's one that actually even said that. So mm -hmm. there, there, there's... I, I agree with you. I think he, he's going to make some big acquisitions before he, before, again, before he heads out. I mean, what's he, 90-some years old? Yeah, you know? there could be a big one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not, together. you know, he's got his legacy, but why not get one more big one? And I think if he does, and this is a little bit out there, that it's going to be something outside of the norm that he normally would be buying. Maybe a little bit more tech-centric, a little bit more innovation uh, versus your traditional, let's go buy, you know, something to make burgers or, you know, with oil and gas, something a little more aggressive. So, and I think there's room for that. I think there's opportunities. So I, I, if, if we see him do that, that kind of will really be good for the market because it tells people out there, okay, Buffett thinks there's a good value now. We need to get in stocks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people see what he does, they pay attention. And if he's going to be willing to put billions of dollars into the market for a major acquisition, yep. if he does, we don't know yeah. if he will or yeah. won't, but it's definitely a vote of confidence. I remember a couple of years ago, you might remember this as well, when Jamie Dimon, bought like it was five or ten million dollars worth of jp morgan stock mm -hmm. and that was the bottom for that stock and for the market yep and so there's certain people that when those kind of things happen other people pay attention and so i'd be looking for some big deals to start coming through i mean it's a good time with stocks down and people are going to want to put money to work at the start of the new year and i think so. we're going to probably see some in healthcare for sure too because i think a lot of these healthcare stock companies are beating up uh, a lot of these large pharmaceuticals um it costs so much to really start uh, from scratch to come up with the next great uh, treatment or drug mm -hmm. breakthrough that there's a lot of smaller biotechs as we call them junior biotechs losing money um, they need to raise money so it's very expensive for them to do that borrowing money now and that's why i've seen they be them get beat up but also you can have a large company like a pfizer or something like that or a merck that's sitting on a ton of cash and come in and buy them you know even pay a 50 to 70 percent premium if not more and take that and develop it under their wings and it ends up being a win-win really for everybody adds to the pipeline and the company gets bought out those shareholders make a ton of money on on the buyout price yeah and that makes sense because uh, as we were saying in the last episode a lot of these speculative stocks that are maybe early stage drugs or they haven't been improved but they've got promising prospects they've been beaten down yep. and so they can get these drugs now and put them in their trials for way less than they would have a year ago exactly so i, I think we see a lot there and there is an ETF out there. It's an ETF for merger, arbit merger arbitrage, symbols MNA. Uh, of course, that <laughs> makes sense. Uh, very, very small, super, super small. But I just was going through and um, it, it's I think it's like up 1% this year. So, But I looked at the returns over the last couple of years. It's like single digit up or down. So it doesn't move much. It's using arbitrage. But if anybody's interested, I just want to throw that out there that there is um, an ETF that kind of goes after the arbitrage that they have with mergers. Uh, the second uh, prediction we have for today is the travel industry will finally surpass pre-pandemic levels. And we've really gotten there already. We're, we've kind of surpassed in some aspect of it, but we're not quite there yet. Um, American Express, uh, credit card issue, obviously, came out and they said spending on travel and entertainment has exceeded their, their expectations. And their total travel and entertainment spending is up 11% from 2019. That's pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. so we're actually up from there. U.S. Travel Agents Association said that travel spending is now 3% higher than 2019, its highest level since the pandemic. So we are seeing some of it get back, but kind of two areas that really haven't gotten back yet and could be the catalyst for travel uh, stocks this year is business travel, international travel. Business travel obviously makes sense because, uh, you know, there's conferences are coming back, but they're not the same because so many people have been accustomed to work from home. You, you know, I go to a lot of conferences, but there's some where I'd rather just watch it on my computer from the office or from sure, home and yeah. take my notes and, and do it that way. Uh, I think that will pick up a little bit more because people are starting to realize that we, without being a person, if you're selling something, you're selling a good or service, it's much easier to be at a conference, talk to somebody face to face, have a drink with them, take them to a dinner than it is to try to call them on a the phone or Zoom. I mean, that's, 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 nobody can argue with me about that. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. That just isn't, that, that, that's something that you have to do. And there's international travel. You know, there was a big, big issue during the pandemic because every country was different. You know, I'd yeah, been in Nicaragua, I had to have a test within a 36 hour window. It had to be a certain kind. It cost me $300. Now he's need a vaccine card, but everything kind of changing a little bit. That, that you're at a, level, a point now where I think international will pick up a bit. You know, I've been to Europe and Central America in the last couple of months and both flights were packed. Uh, airports are packed. 
Uh, I just flew up here what last week, week and a half ago. It was insane how busy these airports are. I tried to get a hotel in New York last week. I just went to hotels.com. I didn't say four star, five star, no star. I just said, give me one and it's right back in, in, in downtown. The cheapest hotel for one night was eight hundred and ninety dollars, <laughs> yeah. and I thought like I messed something up, and I went to every website. It was the same damn way, sold out, charging exuberant prices. Granted, New York City during holidays is one of the greatest places in the world, but it just shows that people want to get out and do things. They want to be around other people. Um, so I, I think that this doesn't end anytime soon, and there's got to be some good plays out there. Yeah, I like the international aspect of that because. As you said, so many countries have had different restrictions for years, and now we're finally getting to the point where a lot of them are either lifting the restrictions or they're at least they're completely open. Yeah. Right. So now people can actually travel a lot easier than it has been in years, and they're probably feeling more comfortable to do so as yeah. well. Yeah. But you're on the road a lot more yeah. than most people, so you see it firsthand. And I noticed the same thing over Thanksgiving when I was traveling. It took us almost three times as long to get home driving wow. than normal. And it's just, I've never seen as many cars on the road as I did that weekend. And so people, you know, are saying that things are slowing down, but from what we're seeing, that's not the case at all. It's, you know, they always call it the, the eye test, right? You yeah. know, uh, you know, look, look around, see, you know, and, and Peter Lynch, one of my favorite, you know, investors of, of all time, invest in what you see. Like, I don't care what they say, what the talking head says or what somebody says, this is what I see. This is boots on the ground. Like there's people out there, right? unless, you know. I just happen to see the busy days in the airport, but like I said, I travel so damn much. I see weekends, you know, weekdays, nights, mornings, I s international, domestic, trains. I was on an Amtrak train just yesterday coming down here. Um, and I've been on a lot of trains recently in the Northeast Corridor. Packed, prices through the roof. Like it's everything. It's hotels, it's trains, it's airfare, um, cars on the road. So I, I just don't see how how it slows down. I don't see what's going to slow down at this point. Yeah, I feel like people just want to get out, as you said. I mean, yeah. after so many years of being cooped up, they want to experience things in person with people. And so if companies that can offer that, like we've looked at Live Nation in the past yeah. as a, a stock where you can go out, you can see a concert, you can see an event or yeah. something, and people are craving those experiences. And so they're willing to pay up too. I mean, the yeah. prices, as you're saying, are high for nearly everything. Yeah, if you want to get a, a ticket to a sports game and stick it to a concert, they're much higher than they've yeah. ever been. Did you see about Taylor Swift tickets going for thirty plus thousand dollars a seat? <laughs> that is absolutely nothing is Taylor Swift, but that is just absolutely stupid. <laughs> that is absolutely stupid. You know, I, I, I mean, I did see her documentary a couple of years ago, and I do have much more respect for her because I think she's extremely talented, not my type of music. But that is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, pay thirty thousand for anything like that. Um, <laughs> that's like if you pay thirty thousand dollars to fly first class, you know, one way like that. Suck it up and sit in a seat. Like I, don't know. I like my first class, but that's again ridiculous. Yeah, that's what people are paying right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, th this isn't a prediction, but you know, it's a holiday season, so you start seeing friends and family. You maybe you don't see that often, right? They know we're in the industry, and you inevitably get asked questions. Oh my God, what do you think about the economy? It's usually negative questions. People that are that are happy don't ask much. It's people are negative. And you know, you hear some of these stories like, oh my gosh, we're going to go into next depression, next great recession. And I want folks to realize the Great Depression, you stood in line for bread. You didn't stand in line for a $1,500 brand new iPhone that you did not need. There's not lines through the airport like you wouldn't believe where people are traveling on vacation. It's a big difference. So it irritates me when you have these fear mongers out there pointing to like depressions and runs on banks and all this crazy stuff. When in reality, just look around. It may be tough because prices are going higher. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not ignoring that fact, Drew. But how can things be so bad in some of these people's minds when, again, people wait in line for a $1,500 phone that's the same as the one they just got last year? Yeah. I mean, they haven't really even changed it much anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, I agree. It's these, those type of events are so rare that people, it always seems like it's coming. It always mm -hmm. seems like, you know, when, once you get a little bit of a down year, in the market or a down, even a down couple of months. Yeah. Like we had during COVID, that was so quick that it, it, the market recovered and snapped right back. So that was like, people got a taste of it, but it was gone really quick. Whereas this has been a long down market where yeah. we're, you know, we're in it for a year and it's been down most of the time. And people think that that means like the next 2000 is coming, the next 2008 is coming, but it's not always a 2008 or yeah. a tech bubble. So it, there's a lot of things that are saying that the economy is not as weak as people may think. 
And if inflation is coming down, mm-hmm. then there's reason to believe that we could turn around. <laughs> I mean, interest rates can come down means yeah. inflation comes down, which means business takes off and people have more money in their pockets because your wages are not going to come down. They're going to stay the same. So you're actually making more money. Uh, your real wages will go up. So, well, speaking of going up, uh, the third prediction in this show I put out and um, I believe Tesla will regain that one trillion dollar valuation. Right now, it's sitting down around just below 500 billion. So about it would have to a little more than double to get up there. And, um, you know, it's the world leader in EVs, electric vehicles. And on the first trading day of 2022, uh, it hit a $1.24 billion or trillion dollar valuation. And obviously it's lost over half that uh, at this point, down about 60% or so. And I think it's creating one of the greatest buying opportunities for one of the most innovative companies of this generation, personally. You know, they have 13.6% of the global market share for EVs uh, through the first half of 2022. The next closest is China SAIC, which is about 9, uh, 9.3%. So they are the leader and they could lose market share because there's obviously more companies coming into electric vehicle space. They could lose market share. But however, the entire market, again, this is lower left to upper right. We talked about last show. You know, the trend is just so big for EVs or a penetration rate right now is in mid single digits in most areas. And that's going to eventually be 100 percent at some point. You know, again, it could be decades down the road, but we got a huge upside potential. And. When it comes to Tesla, I, I also see a couple of other catalysts in the next year plus. Um, they just rolled out their first fully uh, electric semi truck, and that's where you're going to see the adoption first, in my opinion. You know, those trucks are driving over, they're having that. I think that's great. Um, I think another thing is autonomous driving, you know, AV, AVs, autonomous vehicles, that level five is basically where you can sit back and take a nap. Yep. Tesla's basically at level four right now, claiming to be level five from time to time, but we're not really there. I think in the next couple of years we hit level five and they'll be the first one to do that. And that's going to change the game because they'll have robo taxis. You'll have all types of industries getting it from them. It won't be us right away. It's going to be more industry getting it. And then the third one is a uh, very often overlooked area is their uh, energy storage business. You know, that that's that's big because we talked about clean energy last show. We, we can harness the wind. We can harness the sun, um, but we have to be able to store it. If you can't store it, it just it's gone. And we 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 are under invested in that and our technology and innovation is not there yet but musk and tesla have made strides in energy storage and i think that's going to be an enormous part of their business which will take them back to over one trillion this year so over 100 percent gainer this year and i think in the next six years or so it's a four trillion dollar company yeah i mean I, I think it's possible tesla is one of those stocks that people have very set views on right it's either you're very much for it or very much against it yes and I, i've never really looked at it that way but i can tell you that the people that I know that have Teslas absolutely love them. Mm-hmm. Everyone I've talked to, my friends that have them and drive them, they are loyalists now yep. and they weren't in the past. So they're, the brand has a very big value that is not really accounted for. That Musk has developed. I mean, true. people are extremely loyal to that company. So yep. while there is going to be more competition and that will hurt them a bit, and yep. there's no doubt about that. But I think that they've built a decent moat that the business is going to rebound I think when Musk stops selling his shares, yeah. if they can get him to stop selling, <laughs> if Twitter can pick back up and he can kind of balance that out, then that's... Yeah. Twitter didn't help Tesla at all. Twitter did not help Tesla. Not yet, yeah. no. He should have stuck with Tesla, but that's a whole other discussion. But yeah. yeah, when he stops selling, I agree. And just to see how we get to that number, um, the company's estimated to bring about $117 billion in revenue in 2023. And the average price of sales over the last five years is about 10.55 for Tesla. That's the average, not the high note, that's the average of the last five years. So if we put that valuation on this year coming up 2023, puts us at 1.23 trillion, which is almost exactly where it was. So, and that's much more than a double uh, from where we're at today. So again, I I think Tesla is a great long-term hold at this point. And uh, a lot of other EV companies and and automakers as well, which we're not gonna get into today, but a lot of other ones out there as well. So prediction number four is that the S&P will rally at, 20, at least 20% at some point in 2023. And the reason I always say at some point is because I have no idea where the S&P is going to finish 2023. Nobody does. Mm-hmm. It's just so hard to time it, right? But I believe be, due to valuations, due to the charts, due to the fact that inflation is going to come down, due to the fact that interest rates should come down, um, Put all that together and the uh, amount of cashing on sidelines with large institutions and even individual investors, that tells me at some point we're going to have a bounce and, and, and a rally, not just a bounce, of at least 20%. So I think the S&P 
from the day it ends 2022 to at some point in 2023, we'll have a 20% gain. Doesn't mean it closes up for the year. It could be down for the year. Doesn't mean we, we don't have two corrections for the year. We could easily have two corrections for the year, if not more. But I think at some point it's up 20%. So if we do have a pullback first quarter, I'm buying heavily into it because I think there's going to be a huge upside at some point during the year at that time. I just think you need to be a little more nimble if, if this is all you're doing. As a long-term investor, what we do for our subscribers, we'll use those dips and, and look for big, big gains in the next three, five, seven years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just you don't have multiple years, multiple down years in the S&P 500 in particular. It's not that common. Yeah. And, you know, we're coming out of a pretty rough year for most investors. So if we're going to still be in a volatile market, which I think is likely, we're going to have a lot of back and forth. A 20% rally at some point in the year seems extremely likely. Yeah. Because even if we do drop a bit further, those bear market rallies are violent yep. and 20% could easily happen. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and again, I just think like his, historically speaking, we haven't had many situations where, you know, 2022, the 60 40 portfolio, which is 60% uh, equity stocks, 40% mm -hmm. bonds, inflation adjusted, uh, one of the worst years in the last century. I mean, it's, it's just, and you look back when that happens, we have a rebound. It just rebounds. It's right. just what happens because, I mean, over time, this U.S. stock market goes higher. And sure, there are bear markets. And sure, there are recessions. There are prolonged periods of stocks going lower. I agree with all that stuff. But unless you think the United States is over, it most likely is going to be much higher five to ten years from now. Much higher five to ten years from now. Yeah, and when sentiment gets this negative, when no one wants to look at the market, and when it's just people are just selling without thinking, yeah, that's when you get these multi-year runs. Yeah. That's how they start. You got to have that extreme pessimism because then it just forces everybody back in when the stocks finally turn higher, which that will happen before everything looks good. Yes. It's yeah. going to happen when things still look pretty bad, honestly. And then all of a sudden stocks are going to start going up and people are going to start rushing back in. Yeah, stocks price in the future. They don't wait for an economist to come out and say we're out of a no, recession. No. I mean, economists still haven't told us we're in a recession. And what's going to happen is next year in 2023, these economists will start coming out of the woodwork and saying, oh, we were actually in a recession in 2022. But by the time they say that, that means we're probably coming out of the recession already. Right. Like it's, it's, it, they are the most useless profession in the world. I mean, it's, I have friends who are, who are meteorologists and I hate saying this because they, they don't get, they're not happy with me. But like a meteorologist can look outside and be like, all right, I'm going to six o'clock news. It's raining outside, a bit chilly. Like you can tell us what's going on. Economists can't even do that. They have, they literally have to wait till it's over. It's like the weatherman telling you on Friday what the weather was like on Monday. Right. How the hell does that help me? That's that's And there was a study and um, it was a deep, deep study. It was done maybe 20 years ago, but it literally went back through to um, civilizations back like a thousand years. And these, they weren't called economists back then, but these people kind of looked at predicting. And they basically said, no recession, and I don't know if I believe this, but it's done by a pretty big university, but basically the majority of economists have never called recession in the last thousand years. I've never called it. Yeah, there you go. It's, yeah, look back, like they can look back and tell you, but they never call it. So it's what the hell's the point of putting them on there? Like, I, I, I don't get it. Like it's, it's so late to the game, but that's what's going to happen. When they come out and tell us we had a recession, we probably already bought them in stocks. Yeah, that's it. So just look for the magazine covers. That's a classic yes. indicator. Yeah, exactly. You can always find that when the economist is yes. like that. <laughs> yeah, the picture of the boar, or the yeah. bear running across, tackling the economist or something. Yeah. It happened again recently with the dollar. The dollar yeah. hit its all time. And it was like King Dollar was on the cover of every magazine. And yeah. <laughs> and that was, it's kind of gone straight down in the last Pretty month much, since yeah. that happened. Yeah, that's, it, that is. That's like one of those funny things, but it, unfortunately, it's like literally remains true. It works like, very like, well, yeah, actually. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, you know, they, it calls the top or calls the bottom, whichever they're, they're, they're calling. So last prediction before we wrap it up here for the year is um, this is kind of just a funny one. I know a lot of you know I love sports and Drew loves sports too. Philadelphia will become the center of the sports world. That's right, folks. 2020, uh, 2023 will be the year of the city of brotherly love. The Phillies are going to win the World Series. They came within two games last year. I just picked up uh, Trey Turner. Uh, so they will win it, and the Philadelphia Eagles, which is my diehard team, is currently 13-1, the best team in the NFL, and they're going to win the Super Bowl. And I, I'm going to be in Philly for two parades this year, which is going to be pretty amazing, so if anybody's there at the parade, let me know. Uh, but it is going to be the best year for Philadelphia sports that we've seen since 1980, in my opinion. I know you don't agree with that. It pains me to say this. I'm a lifelong Giants fan, so watching the Eagles dominate right now, it's not easy, <laughs> but... They're looking pretty good. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but your Giants can make the playoffs. The hated Dallas Cowboys make the playoffs. And maybe even, not the Redskins, but uh, Commanders may make the playoffs as well. Yeah. All four from our division. So a big division. But I want to end on a light note, folks. But don't forget, 
You can get all Tenny's predictions all written out in a free PDF uh, report for you. Go to McCall Prediction 2023. It's McCall Prediction 2023 for a free report with a breakdown of everything we've talked about in today's show as well as Tuesday's show. And again, don't forget, we will not be uh, broadcasting next week, taking the last week of the year off, giving everybody a little bit of a vacation, recharge, you ready for 2023. That being said, we're going to put out a couple uh, free reports, uh, our daily next week as well. We'll be coming out uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we're going to be talking about some of other predictions, kind of breaking them down a little bit deeper. So don't miss that uh, coming out in the Matt McCall Daily Insight. But again, we're off next week. But folks, please have a wonderful holiday season. Um, Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you have the best new year because we won't have a show coming back till after the new year. Be safe. Be grateful. Be thankful. Hug your loved ones. You never know what the future brings. Uh, but spend time, spread joy. Um, and uh, honestly, just wake up with a smile and realize that we had a pretty crappy year in the market this year. But uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll get ahead. Uh, be grateful for your health, your family, and next year, I'm telling you, we're going to make some damn money. All right. For Drew McConnell, I'm Matt McCall. Have a happy new year. Thanks for watching Matt Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.